there's no money in the world for guys who can affect a change in nothing. When I'm the brain's allusions to the truth that's really changed, there's no change with this. <coughs>
as the bears can tell. I could feel that for yourself, but uh, so we give away a lot of these C CDs and the uh, samplers and put them on the web, so we stream them down all over the world. So I just would say if you get a chance, you probably get some CDs here afterwards. You're welcome to take those. And it's a path unto God, unto itself. Just the path of letting the music just wash over you and feeling that love just pour over you. It's, it's the results of the ego. Okay. Are there any other questions or anything that you'd like to talk about in this next segment? This is certainly a pleasure. It's, there were two Course of Miracles groups this afternoon within 60 miles of each other meeting. And uh, it's nice to be home where you have a choice. And uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, being appropriate is difficult for me. I get a lot of occasions to say, whoops. Talking to people. You are so strong. I appreciate that. I sometimes tend to be abrupt and give me a little bit of it. Some people don't want to hear as much as perhaps some people do. Sometimes I want to have a few minutes or an hour to talk to a person that wants what is here so desperately. But I can put them off instead of holding them off with my comments. And I'm going to do this. Do you have any suggestions? I can certainly do it. I appreciate it. Sure, this is a real good question. Um, yeah, it, the more you get into the transformation of mind, the more it does seem to be more effortless, almost like you're. Uh, it's transparent and it's just pouring and radiating through you and it feels uh, very joyful and, and more natural, less abrupt. Um, but there's a couple of aspects to your question that are really helpful. Um, the first aspect I'll talk a little bit about is the, the idea of, uh, of being appropriate. Um, you'll find that the Holy Spirit will speak through, and in general, what I've always found is, is the message of the, the joy, the freedom, the happiness, the laughter, that is really the message. So it comes through in a way that uh, could be most helpful, as the Course kind of puts it, to the miracle receiver. Uh, and so that's one aspect of it, is when it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, and you know, it feels more and more involuntary, and miracles are involuntary. And whenever there's a sense of, of trying to have a little bit of control that comes in there, uh, that's where the abruptness can come in and it can feel inappropriate and or somebody, the signs can be like people are turned off or uh, breaking eye contact, uh, changing the subject. You know, it can be either verbal, very uh, direct, like, get out of my face, I've heard enough, or the subtle, more nonverbal clues that people used to get, you know, which is, that's, that's enough. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I was traveling in Florida recently and a friend of mine was going through absence from Felicity. And it reminded me of the story where um, Helen Shuckman is late for work. She's been scribing the course and she gets to work and she's late for work. And when she comes back, she realizes Jesus and here I am doing your work. <laughs> scribing a course of miracles and I get to work and I'm late. And I was like, this is... He was projecting onto Jesus, and basically Jesus said, well, you know, you, you have to ask me, you know, when to stop and when to start, and, and you're basically saying, uh, good scribes should be under Christ's control, and basically said that the reason uh, she seemed to be late for work and she had all this anger coming up because of indiscriminate miracle working. <laughs> <laughs> in this and there's Helen Shekhar who's taken this down for seven years and she has been into indiscriminate miracle work and I just had to laugh when I read it because I thought okay 
So it just shows you about what we're talking about. When we talk about being under Christ's control, it's really just really letting go of the ego so that, that uh, there's a real attentiveness in the sense that he was saying to Helen, you know, you could ask, ask me when to start and ask me when to stop and so on and so forth. Don't take anything for granted, you know, and, and think about how in human relationships, that's the way it goes. At the beginning, you know, when you have the first date and you're all attentive and you put on good impressions and, you know, everything. It's so crisp and attentive and everything. And then when you've been married for 20 years or something, like, yeah, yeah, same the same thing. <laughs> I know exactly what you're going to do and uh, you know what I'm going to do. So what, that's just the familiarity breeds contempt, you know, that, that the, this ego thing thinks it knows. Even the simplest things like what relationships are, who people are, how things are going to go, and things like even describing the course. Uh, the other thing I'd like to talk about is the thing about being appropriate. Um, my friend Dorothy, I think there is Dorothy, when I, was, when I met her early on uh, years ago in Moscow, uh, uh, we would have these discussions, and I noticed a lot of times with Dorothy is that we would go around to different places, and uh, Dorothy was just beaming, and her cheeks were rosy red, and she was just bundle of joy, just flowing, flowing, flowing joy. And some real zingers would come out of her mouth. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if the world would even judge them appropriate, but they were so profound that they would stop the show. In fact, a lot of times, sometimes people's jaws would drop and their heads would turn kind of like to do a double take. Like, what did she just say? And then, they would look at her and see her just absolutely beaming. And they would kind of turn and go, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so what would probably could be judged from the world, some real zingers, you know. And Jesus let go some pretty good zingers in his time too. But it's not so much the words, it's the presence behind the words. When you really get into the joy, your presence teaches. In fact, it teaches to demonstrate. So I would say that Dorothy was just flowing around in her great joy, always demonstrating this great, great joy that was literally beyond the words. But occasionally the little zingers would come out and the heads would turn and the mouths would drop and then people would, it would, it would be a great thing. I'm sure they would probably think about it later in the day like, wow, I never thought of it that way. It was just kind of a, like a bright star, like a comet in a dark night. So it's not always that the Holy Spirit will guide you to just be appropriate in the sense that uh, what the Course really will do, it will, it will take you out of people please. But it will also give you the joy that really is the teaching behind the words. Because we all know that we've had spiritual teachers and people we've looked up to and, and the words have sounded very eloquent. But unless there's the presence behind the words and unless there's the consistency of that state of mind, then you know how children are. If the parents say, don't do this, don't do that, if, if the parents don't demonstrate the, the integrity and the consistency, you know, the kids will not pay attention <laughs> to the parent. It's similar with us. When we really get into the likeness and happiness and peace and joy that the Course is all about, that the presence, the I Am Presence is, that's really what does the teaching. And then you won't have to worry so much about, you know, how people take the words. The, the, the Beatitudes world. <laughs> will speak so loud that they'll, they'll uh, shout beyond the words, whatever the words could say. And the third aspect I'd like to talk a little bit about, it kind of ties in a little bit with, um, with uh, that thing about indiscriminate miracle working. Um, miracles are involuntary. And so if there's an aspect of control that's involved about where to bestow the miracles, like, oh, so-and-so, they really got to hear this. Or, you know, if you find yourself going to family members and certain people with your life that, where you feel like you've rubbed the wrong way and you start to get into a little bit of a, a discourse here and there about, no, this is the way it really is, <laughs> then, you know, this is where the ego's control is coming in. Because, you know, miracles should inspire and bless and should bring a sense of joy, not like you're trying to cram something down somebody's throat. And, there's a great section in the Course on Correction of Error, you know, where he basically says, your brother is always right, even if he is speaking insanely, because he is the Son of God. 
what a powerful section. Your brother is always right, you know, and that, that's how you stay happy. We were talking about, would you rather be right or happy? If you always remember that your brother is always right, even if they're speaking insanely, then you see the calls for love and you sh let your light shine and you'll know there's joy there because of that experience. But once you start getting into correcting, then that's where the error is coming in. It's as if somehow that the truth is some kind of intellectual or conceptual endeavor and that these people don't have the correct concepts. But truth is an experience, he says, and it cannot be described or explained, only experience. So that should be like a key uh, indicator of what these miracles are about. So I always just remember, you know, they're involuntary. Uh, we, uh, Linda Carpenter and I were talking too about how when you just show up with presence, that's it. So you, you've completed your full responsibility. Uh, not so much showing up just in body, but when you come with willingness to just be truly helpful and you're completely clueless about how to do it, you are in a real good state of mind because then the Holy Spirit can flow through you so effortlessly. Even if you show up and you're willing to be helpful, but you still are going to try to use some past learning, like, yeah, last week at the Miracle Conference I did this technique or this that, you know, you're going to find you're still going to get into struggles because if you're trying to bring anything from the past to the present, it's not going to really allow the Holy Spirit to flow through smoothly. So it does take seemingly practice. That's what this is really about. It's great. The, the study of the book is very important, the doing the workbook lessons. The teacher manual, they're, they're really all very important. But in the end, it's that experience of, you know, forget this world, forget this course, and come with open arms unto your God. That, you know, you may for a while use the words of the course, uh, or the actual, the actual book, um, as like a prop. But in the end, you want to be able to set the prop down and just say, okay, here we go, Holy Spirit. Let's wing it. Let's go for it. <laughs> kind of like the, the nestling that finally gets pushed out of the nest. There's plenty of time in the nest to flap those wings and, you know, try them out and everything. But once you finally get pushed out of the nest, then that's when the, the real undoing begins. And you get, get to really flap your wings in and, and let the spirit be that gust of wind underneath you. And, and we were coming over here uh, on the ferry and we were watching... Uh, Dave was saying that the updraft coming up from the around the boat was just lifting and, and the seagulls were just like perched right above us. And it was such a powerful symbol of these seagulls right above our heads, just not moving at all. They were just allowing the updraft from the boat to come and just carry them for a little bit of a joy ride <laughs> all the way over here. So that was, that's the kind of a symbol that, that reminds you of.
to try to um, dissociate what it is that's causing still a leftover spasms. Now, from two years ago to today, I um, have applied deeper spiritually. All I had during this time was God and myself and chanting and prayer.
crazy ego distortions, then the best way to look at those symptoms that you're talking about is this is a call to give your mind permission and get in touch with what, what you really want, what's really there as, as you're calling on to do. So that's the best way to look at uh, those kind of things because uh, yeah, I encounter a lot of people who go through a lot of things like that. And when you were talking too, it was reminding me, I don't think I've ever read the book, but somebody was telling me one time years ago about a book, it was called like, Johnny Get Your Gun or something, it was about a, a man and uh, who apparently as the book goes on, it seems like he's, he, he kind of figures out that he's, he's just been in the war. He's kind of, he's so delus delusionary and he just doesn't, he's not in touch with what's going on. But as the book moves along, he thinks, I think I must have just been on a battlefield. And then as the book progresses through the chapters, he realizes that, that he can't see and then that he can't hear. And he goes a little farther and he can't smell. <laughs> he goes further yeah. and he can't taste and he can't touch that he has no use in all of his five senses. But the book reaches the climax, of course, at the very end where he realizes, I still exist. I still exist. I don't have any use of the five senses, but I still exist. Think how different that is from the ego sphere when the senses start to go. You know, how many of us when we were kids or younger, we might have thought, what the problem would be if I couldn't see or if I lost a limb? You ever ponder those things, you know? Well, it's like in your case where the senses seem to be shutting down or dying, the, the panic attacks are coming from the ego. And it's going, oh my God, that is terrible. I'm, I'm disappearing. Uh, my resources, my means of, of perceiving the world are going. Well, the neat thing about it is you start to realize that consciousness of the mind is not dependent on the five senses. In fact, the reason I, I point this out is like a lot of times people, I've had a lot of people who come to me and they'll say they've had out-of-body experiences, or some people have had what they call near-death experiences. I call them more life. I think of them life. It doesn't make any sense to death. But, but what happens is they find themselves like up in the corner of the room or floating above the body. As many near-death experiences have talked about or uh, people who have out of body experiences. And they say, I could hear everything that was going on and I could see everything in the room and I could, could uh, even smell things. I mean, they, they describe in vivid detail everything that goes on, word for word, and how it looked, the colors, the vibrancy, and everything. And yet they're telling me that they're up in the corner of the room looking down on their body. Looking down their body with what? <laughs> is there an eyeball up <laughs> in the corner of the room? Is there a little ear up there? A little brain with little neurotransmitters? No, they're perceiving the whole scene without eyes and nose and ears and fingers and everything. They're perceiving the whole thing. That's why when people say to me, you know, about somebody, oh, I, can't, I feel so bad, I, I had my chance to talk to so and so, forgive them, but now they're in a coma. It says, the body lying there in a coma, has, they have no way of communicating. Well, communication is not limited to the five senses. Let me tell you, five senses literally have nothing, nothing to do with existence or with communication. You know how everyone, we talk about workshops and, and talking about things and being able to say, open up with words and this and that. There's no communication going on on the horizontal plane, and this world is the horizontal plane that all the Course is doing is it's helping us get in touch with vertical, we might say, communication, which is communion, you know, the name of, of the carpenter's book. <laughs> communion, this is about communion, and communion is a state of revelation in which you know your Creator. Now, that is communication, and all this stuff that involves words and the five senses, is what? Jesus says words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. <coughs> Why does that put words in no place? You know? And even this thing about the book and, and being scripture and holy words and everything. Well, if they're symbols of symbols twice removed from reality, all the Holy Spirit's doing is saying, well, we can use these words to help 
train your mind in meditation, and that's what some of the visualizations are about in the workbook, and we can use for guided meditations and so forth. But if you really get into the workbook, you see that it's about going beyond the words. In fact, there is even a place in the workbook where Jesus says, our use for words is almost over now. Wow! <laughs> that's good news. It's not, this isn't a frightening thing or a threatening thing. This is the good news of the kingdom. So I hope this helps in the sense that what it does is it starts to put things into perspective. That when things start to get, your ego starts to panic, you can just start to relax and let go and ease into the experience that your mind is calling for that's beyond the senses. And I should mention Carrie, who's behind me, that she, that was a very pivotal experience going into that hot attic because very shortly after that, we ended up going down to Tennessee into a very remote little uh, cabin that was very rustic, tucked in the, the mountains of northern Tennessee, and uh, stocked her up with water and food for about three weeks, and uh, she zipped into a mystical experience that just went on and on and on after she gave her mind permission. And that came right on the heels, seemingly, of a face that was ready to explode, <laughs> of pain, of a loud voice, uh, voices in her mind, and, and noise, the chatter turned up to a high volume, which seems like, you know, like you're dying, is really how it feels, but actually, it's just going right past that to that experience that you really long for.